and welcome to Fraud Eat Strategy, an FTI consulting podcast series in which we explore the myriad ways that fraud, corruption, and misconduct can derail strategy and, and cause havoc. I'm Scott Moritz, Senior Managing Director in FTI's Forensic and Litigation Consulting segment, where I assist clients and their outside counsel in managing their response to event-driven white-collar crime, misconduct, and bribery incidents. Thank you for listening. In this episode, we're going to talk about why this may be exactly the right time to perform a meaningful fraud risk assessment. The name of the episode is Performing a Fraud Risk Assessment is Like Finding Unexploded Hand Grenades. Fraud risks are like potential explosions. The vulnerability to fraud can lay dormant for years until and unless someone in a position to exploit the control weakness formulates a rationalization and is off and running. Joining me today is Bruce Doris. For the past 14 years, Bruce has held various positions at the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners and is currently its CEO and president. The ACFE is a member organization of over 85,000 certified fraud examiners and is the world's largest anti-fraud organization. The ACFE is also a standard setter for anti-fraud and investigative leading industry practices, having created many very important publications, including the Report to the Nations, the Occupational Fraud and Abuse Classification System, and the Fraud Risk Management Guide. Welcome, Bruce. Thanks for joining me today. Happy to be here, Scott. Thanks for having me on. Oh, sure. This is great. So the ACFE publishes an incredibly valuable report every two years called the Report to the Nations, which is a detailed study of fraud investigations performed by ACFE members. The report and other publications frequently cite the figure that 5% of revenue is lost to fraud, waste, and abuse every year. The CARES Act has or will distribute $2 trillion. Using that 5% figure, is it reasonable to think that $100 billion of it or more could be lost to fraud, waste, and abuse? You know, Scott, you have $2 trillion at stake. There's obviously an enormous opportunity for fraudsters to take advantage of the programs that are intended to help people who really need it. And we've been seeing this make its way through the news over the last several months, especially when you've got really pervasive frauds that are taking place by those who are trying to take advantage of the amount of the limited resources and in terms of time that the government is able to address $2 trillion going into an economy. And look at this before, and it's, we start thinking about this perfect storm fraud. And when you've got that much money coming in and it, rules are still being developed today, what it it really boils down to is this, the level of oversight and enforcement that we're going to have to see from the government. And fortunately, at least from for those of us who are sort of fraud examiners with the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee, it was established shortly after the CARES Act. One of my friends and ours, Linda Miller, who's their deputy executive director, and going in and making sure that there is some accountability here. And they're just getting started with that. So I think that they are likely to keep uncovering more attempts or, you know, and certainly finding some fraud that's taking place and hopefully enacting some, some stricter measures in order to limit the amount of loss associated with the schemes that are trying to take advantage of what the CARES Act was there for is to help businesses and help individuals getting on their feet and making their way through the pandemic. You know, as fraud practitioners, we're always advising people that you have to have robust anti-fraud controls, you have to slow things down, get a really good feel for the risks that are nuanced to a given situation. And all that had to kind of be suspended in this situation because the need was so great, the human toll was potentially so devastating that the relief act was, here's $2 trillion, fraud risk controls to follow. But it, you know, yeah. I, I think that's always the case, right? Whether it's a hurricane or an earthquake or maybe prior economic crises, it, you have to apply those controls after the fact. It's just out of necessity. I remember after my home state of Louisiana, after Hurricane Katrina hit, and you've got all these amounts of money coming in in order to help people who are washed away. And in the rebuilding effort, there are fraudsters who are coming in because again, the opportunity is there. The lack of controls, not so much in that the, there was a willful lack of controls. It's just they're trying to help people and move things much, much faster. But we had to come, once the tide is where we can go in and start looking at this, you know, hopefully the PRAC is able to do so with the $2 trillion that are in our economy now. So fraud risk assessment, as you well know, is, is not necessarily 
embedded into every organization. And even if an organization performs fraud risk assessments at regular intervals, not all fraud risk assessments are really tailored to the organization's unique risk profile. Is there a business case to be made that with all of the focus on resilience that there is right now, that now is the ideal time to perform a fraud risk assessment? No, oh, absolutely. If you think about a fraud risk management plan it is and a fraud risk assessment, that's not even static in a non-pandemic time. And so when looking at what how we've changed, you know, these fraud risk assessments are intended to be a living initiative. There's very little value in it being a one and done exercise that we do in the first quarter and then we just spit it out and we're done in terms of compliance and we've met that. If you go back and look at our research and what you've looked at with the report to the nations, and then some of the benchmarking studies that we've done in the wake of COVID-19. Anti-fraud experts are expecting every category of fraud to increase over the next year. Cyber risks, fraud by vendors, sellers, customer payment fraud, business email compromise, which I saw one just a few hours ago before we started this podcast. I mean, it's, it's incredible the amount of fraudulent activity that is going to just take place, going back to what we were just talking about, because the opportunity are there, fraudsters are taking advantage of the disruption. And people are focused on their jobs, but they're working at home. So they have other things that are going on that are distractors. And when you start mixing that together, it creates that perfect storm fraud. So the 2020 report to the nation stated that a lack of internal controls contributed to a third of all fraud cases that were a part of the study. What's the interrelationship between fraud risk assessments and internal controls? And is it ever a good practice to make changes to the internal controls without first assessing fraud risk? a great question, Scott. A friend of mine kind of put it this way. Internal controls are designed and implemented without a solid broad risk assessment are kind of like getting dressed in the dark. And I mean, you kind of know where everything is in the closet. You might put the right, you put a shirt on and a jacket, pants, skirt, whatever it is that you're wearing. But if you're like me, especially when you got dressed in the dark uh, back when we used to go to an office, you know, perhaps you got one black sock and one blue sock and things like that. So you might get dressed, but you might not be matching. And so look at the 2,500 frauds that were studied in that particular report. That is something that a well-designed fraud risk assessment can help prevent. And so going in and looking at those areas. Now, it takes a great team in order to do that, both internally and externally, and having consultants come in who really know how to drive and look and conduct a really strong fraud risk assessment. So when we start looking at some of those benchmarking risks, that's got to be part of that fraud risk assessment as well. Simply because we have some controls in place does mean that we've considered the fraud fraud risk that are relevant and it can really, really damage this organization. That's really good points that you just made. So the ACFE has been publishing its report to the nation since 1996. How have fraud and fraud risk awareness changed since then? When the first report was conducted back in 96, as you mentioned, companies were still reluctant to even say the word fraud. And the word fraud as it related to auditing standards. So we've come a long, long way since the very first report to the nation. But when you start looking at the adoption of a lot of these anti-fraud controls, you see within the report of how, how that median dollar loss and the median time in which it is a big fraud awareness. I think that you know, practitioners like yourself and FTI are really on board with telling an organization, hey, look, just by having this code of conduct, just by having this training, just by having a hotline and just a few other, even what I would call low-cost barriers around entry level are really helping these organizations save money in terms of the fraud loss that is no longer going to be applicable. And so just having these mechanisms in place, the data supports that. And it's really something that we've been encouraged, especially in the last 10 years, we started looking at organizations adopting more training, more awareness within their organizations. They have a lot of uh, value out of the International Fraud Awareness Week. It's in November, really watching chapters within the ACFE, sponsors out there, organizations really trying to make 
make this something that their company highlights during that week. And we continue to have more and more adoption every year. And I think that's got a lot to do with the mindset changing since it was in 1996. So I think the report's grown considerably that helped a lot of organizations. It certainly has. So many statistics about fraud sort of are taken directly from the report to the nations. And I'd have to say that whole 5% of revenue statistic is got to be the one of the most cited statistics that there is, when at least when it comes to fraud and fraud risk. So many organizations really struggle with whether they need to perform fraud risk assessments and how to go about implementing fraud risk management programs. And, and yet, you know, the 2013 revisions to the COSO framework placed far greater emphasis on fraud risk assessment than ever before. And despite that, many executives really seem to struggle to conceptualize the various frauds that could affect their organization. And that is until the discussion turns to specific fraud scenarios. How important is the use of risk-tailored fraud scenarios in assessing fraud risk and in fraud training and why? It's a great question, Scott. When you start thinking about the mindset, maybe completely different depending on the organizations of how they want to move forward. Some, I don't want anything to do with fraud. We don't have any fraud in this organization. Others have bought into what we are trying to encourage within organizations. But it kind of reminds me of back when I first started prosecuting over 25 years ago now. But what nobody wanted to handle the financial fraud case. So I use that opportunity to say, hey, look, there's a lot going on here. And I think that when you see certain organizations like, look, we don't want to deal with this. And if we're able to show, fraud examiners are able to show, as you were mentioning, that through that risk-tailored fraud scenario approach, this is what it's costing us with our supply chain in Asia, or this is what it's costing or could cost us here. And some of the deficiencies, that gets attention because that is fact specific. That is showing like, okay, these aren't just general statistics. And one of the things that we've tried to really bear down to the report to the nations is having this sub-regional data so that it's not just something that's global, but rather really pertinent to a region or pertinent to a specific industry within government, within nonprofits. And so we're really able to break down a lot of the data that we've been able to accumulate so that fraud practitioners like yourself can take that to clients, can take that to management, whoever it is, and be able to show them, hey, look, this is what our fellow fraud examiners are, are showing in their part of the world, in their industry, in their business, that this is an issue for us. And if we're able to go in and, and really attack this and have these controls put in place, we're going to reduce that fraud and reduce the risk of losing this amount of money over this amount of time, just by you know these minimal investments and a good overall fraud risk management structure. If you look at some of the stats from the report, fraud training for employees, fraud training for managers and executives, and just a fraud risk assessment, we're associated with about a third lower fraud losses and a third faster detection. And so that means something over time. I mean, the bigger the company, obviously the bigger that savings, if you want to call it. Because if when you start looking at that fraud that does occur, depending on what the margin is of the company, that's, that's a lot they have to make up in terms of revenue in order to build and get that money back that they would have had from whatever the, the profit margin was for that organization. So why not make less in terms of making that investment into a really strong fraud risk management policy that begins with a strong fraud or part of, depending on the organization, part of that a good fraud risk assessment. Obviously, it's going to depend on the region, but that fraud risk assessment really lays that groundwork for showing those deficiencies within that organization. Because just to, to take a cookie cutter approach could be wasting, I mean, you know, this with how we're going to go in and really effectively look at controls. And there could be some control in place that aren't necessary, or at least we don't need them to the same level. But it, we won't know that until we actually have the fraud risk assessment to see from a heat map perspective, what are the problem areas that we have? You know, if we're starting to look and do a, an inquiry and see a lot of top-sided journal entries, then we need to start looking for some overriding of internal controls by upper man. You know, so we don't get there until we actually have that fraud risk assessment. Well, I couldn't agree more. And I think one of the maybe less heralded benefits of meaningful fraud risk assessment is the extent to which you are really raising awareness about fraud risk in the course of doing interviews or doing roundtable discussions with or workshops with senior executives. Because I find that at the outset of all of those discussions, there's this misplaced optimism and confidence that we don't have a fraud problem and our controls are rock solid. And so everybody is just expressing almost uh, this entire process is unnecessary. And that's why I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about scenarios because inevitably, 
simply when we start then rolling out these very simplistic fraud scenarios that are really kind of ubiquitous, right? That are can affect you no matter what kind of organization you may be. And and then we just follow that with that. Well, could that happen here? Oh yeah. You know, would it be financially harmful? Is it, oh yeah, it'd be devastating. What are we talking about here? Absolutely. It, I think it's the scenario is what turns that abstract concept of fraud into like, oh, well, okay, now you're putting it in terms that are actually sort of operational and happening here every day. And then it starts to come together then. Well, that's one of the things that we stress through the ACFB training that we do. We have a number of faculty members, a number of speakers at our conferences. The one thing that we have preached for a number of years, anybody can go in and read slides about theory on fraud risk assessment, even or whatever the case may be, but they need takeaways. They need scenarios in order to really let that the that education resonate and let it get into their brain to where, okay, I can see myself on Monday morning, not going back into the office, but getting online and doing a Zoom call. Really, I see how that could happen in our organization. And that's one of the most rewarding things is to listen to uh, practitioners, fraud examiners who have attended our training and then talking to me weeks, if not months later, like, hey, I went back, we did this, we called this fraud taking place saved us tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. But it's because it went beyond theory. It went into specific risk-based scenarios that are happening today. And that's what the reports, that even beyond the report to the nation, Scott, you go to acfe.com, you'll see a number of benchmarking reports there for technology within an organization or investigative teams within that organization. So you're not just going alone at it. There are a lot of people who have, like yourself, who have dealt with this for decades and both in the government, in your case, with the Bureau, and then also in the private sector that can really, really help those who are just getting started that just need that push in order to conduct that fraud risk assessment. It's really so true. So in the past eight years or so, Bruce, the SEC and the DOJ have released a number of publications publicizing their expectations for ethics and compliance programs. And some of what the government has termed hallmarks of effective compliance programs include risk assessment, confidential reporting, and internal investigation and code of conduct and compliance policies and procedures. So without a fraud risk assessment or other types of risk assessments setting out the, the blueprint for an ethics and compliance program, is it realistic to think any of the hallmarks of your program aren't compromised since they were done without the benefit of examining organizational risk? Well, it's certainly been encouraging to see regulators increasingly emphasize the importance of a risk-based approach to, to both compliance and to anti-fraud programs. In fact, seeing justice come out with that just in the last couple of months. And there are certainly hallmarks of effective programs. We try to preach is that organizations can't take such guidance as a prescriptive checking the box mentality or this li list of components, all things they just need to do. And it's something that I've been adamant about. I mean, we have to make this come to life. I mean, just having, okay, we did this, we did this in this quarter, and then we had you know, by year end, we check it off again. To your point, if management's implementing compliance policies and procedures just to be able to say they did them without that deep understanding of the organization's, not just the compliance side of it, but just the, the overall corporate ethos. Not only do they risk becoming ineffective and protecting from the fraud side of it, but certainly there's going to be more regulatory scrutiny on the back end. So you get not only just the fraud loss itself, but then any types of fines that are going to come on the back end. Anything else that a monitor might find, they're really got to that level. Those are really great points you make, Bruce. So for the first time ever, this is pretty recent, the ACFE held its annual fraud conference virtually. And it was a very successful event, but you know, certainly not without its challenges and telling the guy who had probably experienced most of the pain associated with that. Are there any new fraud vulnerabilities that organizations should be on the lookout for most with most of our workforce working from home? Well, if you think about it from the ACFE virtual fraud conference, I mean, we did all of that from home. In our part of Texas, it was we had to make that decision. We were under complete lockdown, as was most of the United States or a lot of the United States and from those who are listening around the world. But you know, one of the things that came out of that, we had to pivot very, very quickly in doing that. But we were, one, we hadn't done it before, at least to that scale. I mean, we had had a couple of tracks in terms of broad conference in the past, but not an entire wholesale conference moving online, especially after we've been doing it in person for 30 years. But in how that gets back, 
back to in terms of fraud risk assessment, we, if you go to acfe.com, you'll see that fraud in the wake of COVID-19, and they had mentioned it earlier at the benchmarking survey. About three-fourths of anti-fraud professionals said preventing fraud is more difficult now than previously, and nearly two-thirds of those said that detecting fraud has become more difficult. That happens. Why? Because we're working at home. We're working remotely. We don't have access. We lost that centralization that we had before. And you know, one of the things I was, we put the, the fraud ACV conference on back in June, but we had done a smaller scale one with our European fraud conference a couple of months before that. And one of the uh, folks from Maersk was talking about, it reminded me of this when you said it, back in 2017, when the petrovirus hit them. And so when that virus comes in and attacks and it comes across in just a minute, they were, he was talking about how he was going in and pulling the cords and disconnecting man physically these machines from their network. Well, if you think about that and extrapolate it across the world. I mean, we are now no longer in a, an office. We can't just yell down the hall for someone to, you know, don't open this compromised email or anything like that. You know, we've got to schedule a Zoom call now or think of it that way. So that lack of centralization has really made us vulnerable as an organization. I mean, we're having to deal with, you know, from an internal audit function, you know, and how we're able to go in and really starting to, to look, access to data, obviously the IT security measures that are in place. So management really has to be proactive about how they're looking at not just the logistical, but just the operational changes and how their organization is vulnerable to fraud. That's why a fraud risk assessment, going back to your earlier question, is so important now in light of everything that's going on with the pandemic. I think it's it's critical, especially when you've got an organization that may be facing furloughs, potential layoffs if they haven't already. I not only have this function, but now I have this one and this one that I really don't have a whole lot of training for, but because we had to reduce the work staff by a third, I'm having to take this on. So there's a lack of training on some of that. They're trying to do what they can to help that organization. But when you when someone doesn't have the training that they need, they're doing everything they can, but that creates a risk there. And so that's why having a, a good, solid pandemic fraud risk assessment is critical right now. Oh, so true. I mean, whether it's the three sides of the fraud triangle, opportunity, pressure, and, and rationalization, they're all amplified just by virtue of the remote workforce, the sort of Damocles hanging over everyone's head in terms of what does the future hold for me personally, for my employer. And then, you know, just in terms of opportunity, so much of management is a term an old boss of mine used to be fond of, which is management by walking around, right? A physically observing people, seeing that they're engaged and doing playing the role that, that they're supposed to be playing, you don't have that. You also don't have some of the obvious red flags that you might see in an office setting that are less transparent, you know, like the prototypical, really difficult, unapproachable personality that sometimes maybe they're just effective people, but other times they're deliberately warning you off to keep you out of what they're doing because what they're doing is no, they're, they're up to no good. But, you know, they, they don't even have to do that if, if they're sitting in their dining room. There are just a whole host of new risks that are associated with this pandemic. They exacerbate some of the old ones, but then there are some new ones you're mentioning there that we have to grapple with and we have to understand if we have to change. And that's, that's hard. It's hard when you're used to doing things from this time to this time and you're structured. And you know, if you're that type of a personality, then I have to do it this way, but we can't check those boxes anymore. So true. Bruce, in recent years, there's increased emphasis on ethical culture. CEOs are speaking out now on important social issues as never before. The prosecutive winds have shifted away from tone at the top, and they've started to use the rhetoric conduct at the top, which really is signaling a clear message on holding people accountable. In a recent issue of Fraud Magazine, there was an article entitled, Sick Cultures Lead to Fraud. What does an organization's approach to fraud risk management tell us about their organizational culture? You know, your question takes me back to one of the hallmarks of the report to the nations that are as relevant today as they were in, in the mid 90s. 1996, when we first started, poor tone at the top is one of the primary contributing factors in overall cases, and especially in the ones that have that huge dollar amount, those financial statement fraud cases. Those are the largest ones. When you start looking at frauds committed by owners and executives, and that median loss is four times that of mid-level managers and 10 times that of staff level employees. So when you start looking at that, you start looking at tone at the top, conduct at the top, that can decimate an organization 
organization. When you go back and look at Enron going back nearly 20 years now with that ranker yank mentality, when that is up there at the top, it infiltrates and it goes throughout the ranks. And the, one of the things that has been something that I have watched many of us at ACFE have seen. Fraud goes beyond just being an accounting or an operational problem or lack of, it's a human. Controls only go so far if the human element is not addressed. So culture, good, strong corporate ethos, you know, a good, strong fraud risk management, which comes out of that, are essential to having a good, strong organization. It's like you start looking at all of these and you've got that in place. I mean, culture, that good, strong fraud risk management program. If you've got one in place, you're going to understand the other. And so if you have a good, strong culture, then it should have a good, strong fraud risk management program. If it's got a weak culture, if it's got one of those Edron type cultures, it's not going to have a fraud risk management or at least a strong fraud risk management. It's going to be a check the box. Oh, we did this on January the 10th in about eight minutes. Those are some really good points you make about ethical culture, Bruce. You know, you and I are fraud insiders and we're we're very familiar, of course, with the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, but for folks that are maybe maybe fraud examination isn't their primary focus, what can listeners do if they want to find out more about the ACFE? I encourage people to go to acfe.com. There's so much information on there. I mean, there's a lot for members and practitioners to dig into, but you know, for those who, who may be listening to this that aren't, as you mentioned, an anti-fraud practitioner, but curious about how, what can I do? Going to acfe.com, looking at fraud, looking at our, uh, we have a new page related to COVID-19 and fraud schemes associated with it. So going in and, and looking and looking at some of the infographics as it relates to the report to the nation, as you've gone through, you're talking about what, nearly 90 pages of data. Okay, that might be overwhelming for someone that's new to fraud, but there's some really cool infographics in there that they explain what we've been talking about here during this podcast. So I encourage anyone that's interested in it, go to the website, play around with it. A lot of information for you to click on and hopefully you come away with a better fraud awareness from it. That's great. And I would add, as somebody that's been doing this for over three decades, for individuals interested in potentially pursuing a career in fraud examination, the materials that you need to study in order to successfully sit for the ACFE exam provides such a great foundation of knowledge for someone who wants to embark on a career. Even for someone who has years of experience doing investigation, the materials are just so comprehensive that inevitably you're going to pick up things that even the most experienced investigator and it maybe hasn't been exposed to because of their focus. So ACFE is a terrific organization for those types of resources and obtaining the CFE credential for some is you know, a really worthwhile while investment. So Bruce, that's all the time we have today. You shared some really great insights with us and thank you very much for your time today. My pleasure, Scott. Thanks for having me on board. Thank you. This concludes this episode of Fraud Eat Strategy. I'm Scott Moritz, Senior Managing Director and FTI Consulting's Forensic and Litigation Consulting segment. Thank you for listening and stay tuned for the next episode of Fraud Eat Strategy when we'll hear from Skadden Arp's partner and FCPA luminary, Gary DiBianco with tips on how to bulletproof your FCPA due diligence and post-merger integration. If you have an idea on a fraud or corruption case topic or guest you'd like to hear about on a future episode, email us at fraudeatstrategy at fticonsulting.com. Thanks for listening.